eviscerated two critical Kalakmul allies that surrounded Tikal, El Peru to the west and Naranjo to the east. Finally, the suffocating noose that had once strangled Tikal was broken. In celebration of this, he builds a, a whole series of, of long major expansions to the palace, uh, new pyramids. And when we look at Tikal today, in many cases, we're looking at the fruits of that success. He may have even launched the construction of the tallest of Tikal's structures, Temple 4. Made of 250,000 cubic yards of stone, the massive pyramid stretched more than 210 feet, or 22 stories high, nearly as tall as the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge. It jutted far above the dense rainforest canopy, with a 180-degree view of the city. In the distance, other Maya cities were also ambitiously building toward the sky. But at this moment, with King Yakin Khan Kawil at the helm, Tikal was the unchallenged powerhouse of the Maya civilization. But Tikal was not alone. Out of sight, about 250 miles to the west, another dynasty is forging the construction of a great Acropolis. There, in the seventh century, a king with a vision would emerge. He would turn one of the wettest cities in the world into a mecca of New World architecture. The view from the top of Temple 4 at Tikal was the backdrop for the Masasi temples in the movie Star Wars. 611 AD, on the outskirts of the Maya world in southeast Mexico, a city by the name of Palenque is on the ropes. It launches a last-ditch defense against regional powerhouse Calakmul. Palenque's forces are overwhelmed, and the king is killed with no male heir to the throne. Because Maya kings were thought to be divine lords, their lineage is key to survival. The end of a dynasty usually spelled disaster. Yet at this critical moment, one of the greatest building campaigns in Maya history was about to begin in Palenque, and the king behind it would remain unknown until the middle of the 20th century. In 1949, some of the questions regarding the mysterious dynasty of Palenque are answered when archaeologist Alberto Ruiz Rullier is excavating this 75-foot high temple, now called the Temple of the Inscriptions. Now, I'm in pretty good shape, but those guys had headdresses and big robes, obsidian knives and swords. I thought I'm in pretty good shape for an old guy anyway, but I don't know how they did it. And I don't know how Alberto Ruslier did it, but I still got a lot to go. And when he gets up into the sanctuary, he looks around. And he notices on the floor a row of holes covered with stone stoppers. And he figures out that these holes were made for ropes in order to pull up the slab, just like I'm on a trap door. So he pulls up the slab, this one exactly, and he follows a steep staircase filled with dirt and debris. He's never seen a Maya pyramid like this before. So his men start digging and digging and digging into the unknown. And the wet stairs are very slippery from the moisture and time and the rain from the forest, and he finally gets down to a plateau. And he notices that the whole pathway doubles back and then continues, and he finds hidden doors secret passageways, signs that a lot of thought and calculation went into building this structure. Finally, after three years, after three long years, he gets to the bottom of this 80-foot stairway, and there he sees a small corridor. And in the corridor is a stone box, and in the box are six skeletons, the remains of souls who were sacrificed to protect the person for whom this temple was built. But he still doesn't know who that person was. And then he finally sees a huge door. 
a massive triangular stone. So his men and he open it, and then they go in. And behind this huge triangular door is a vaulted crypt about 30 feet long and 23 feet high. And inside the crypt is this massive sarcophagus carved from one piece of limestone. And on top of this sarcophagus is this magnificent lid with these expertly carved images of a king. Along this edge, by the way, which is covered with cinnabar, this red stuff, is poison to the touch to keep looters from coming in here and ruining it. And by the way, if the ancient Egyptians might have used this, we might have had more antiquities coming out of that country today. But along this edge is the image of a shield. And up in the sanctuary is another image of a shield. And the ancient Maya word for shield is pakal. So Alberto Rus had discovered the tomb of the most important Maya king, Pakal the Great. Pakal's ascension to the throne in 615 AD came during the most critical time for Palenque. With no direct heir, the elders of Palenque had turned to an outsider, a royal who lived outside the kingdom named Lady Sakkuk. Now she returned to Palenque with her adolescent son, Pakal. The future of Palenque hung in the balance as the young boy was crowned king by his mother. He was just 12 years old. She sort of kept the throne warm for him for over 10 years while he was growing up. As the young king grew into adulthood, Pakal had to deify himself to legitimize his rule. He declared his mother to be the living embodiment of the first mother who created humans and the gods. He then was the son of a goddess, an exalted position that removed any question of his legitimacy. He was almost certainly a charismatic fellow. He had to have been. He had no power base. He had to do it almost on pure charisma and determination. As a Johnny come lately, as someone who needs to prove himself, he's going to be as splashy as possible. And so he constructs the most gaudy buildings imaginable. He is establishing all sorts of new architectural patterns. To authenticate his lineage, Pakal set off on a building spree to revitalize his battered kingdom. One of his first orders of business, the renovation and expansion of the royal palace, an impressive structure that sits in the heart of the main plaza. More than 70,000 square feet, the palace would become a maze of galleries, chambers, stairways, courtyards, and tunnels, and was designed to reflect his ideas of grandeur. At first, Pakal's architects, like those throughout the Maya world, employed what is called the corbelled vault to support their soaring structures. Um, now, this was a, a pretty straightforward um, structure where uh, a series of lines of stones of ever-decreasing height are laid on top of each other. So it forms really a kind of inverted V-shape uh, with a row of capstones along the top. But the corbelled vault left something to be desired. This basic construction limited interior space and light and forced architects to build walls wider than even the space it enclosed. Driven by a determined king, Pakal's engineers now looked for solutions to this problem. What the Palenque designers succeeded in doing was lightening the weight. Um, they produced sort of honeycomb structures on the top of these buildings. They could make their spans wider area, more light could come in. These innovations reduced the stress on the load-bearing walls, creating a more open and inviting feel than the traditional Maya buildings. Over 60 years, Pakal's builders became the best in the new world. But it wasn't until the end of his rule that Pakal commissioned one of the most complex and imaginative projects ever attempted by the Maya, the Temple of the Inscriptions. The discovery of the Temple of the Inscriptions changed all our ideas about Maya pyramids. They weren't supposed to be uh, mortuary uh, shrines. Inside, along a stairway leading down to the tomb, engineers built a psychoduct, or hollow tube. It's a conduit that allows someone on the top of the pyramid to speak into this speaking tube, and eventually you would be able to presume...